pleasure of speaking with Jill Robinson, founder and CEO of Animals Asia. Founded in 1998, Animals Asia promotes compassion and respect for all animals and works to bring about long-term change. Animals Asia is the leading organization tackling the brutal bear bile trade in Asia, which sees over 10,000 bears kept on bile farms in China, and according to official figures, 600 approximately suffering the same fate in Vietnam. Animals Asia also works to end the trade in dogs and cats for food in China and Vietnam, and lobbies to improve the welfare of companion animals, promote humane population management, and prevent the cross-border export of meat dogs in Asia. Jill is a council member of the World Federation of Chinese Medicine Society's Herbal Committee, and her outstanding contribution to animal welfare has been widely recognized with a number of awards. Namely, in 1995, she won the Reader's Digest Hero for Today Award. In 1998, she was made a member of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire by Queen Elizabeth of England. In 2008, she was named Outstanding Earth Champion in Hong Kong and was appointed World Animal Day Ambassador in Asia. In 2010, she was one of the 12 recognized foreigners given the You Bring Charm to China Award. In 2012, Jill received an honorary doctorate in veterinary science from the University of Zurich, Switzerland. And finally, in 2014, she was given an honorary law degree from the University of Nottingham, Ningbo, China. So quite an impressive resume. Thank you and welcome to the show, Jill. Thank you, Jada. Lovely to be here. Yes, well, I'm absolutely honored to have the uh, opportunity to speak with you today and to learn and highlight the wonderful work that Animals Asia is doing. Uh, but before we delve into those details, I always like to have a little bit of a background note on our guests. And so if you wouldn't mind um, telling viewers at home, uh, where were you born and raised and what was it like growing up? And did you always have this love and passion for animals? Gosh, yeah, well, I was born in the UK, in Nottingham. And uh, yeah, uh, it was quite a sad story because my mother died when I was a baby. So um, my sister and I lived with my auntie and uncle for a number of years before moving back with my father, who was still single. Um, uh, when I, I was about nine years of age, mm -hmm. so I remember always begging my father to get a, a you know a dog or a cat, and he finally relented. Um, I think when I was about twelve or thirteen, and we had a beautiful black and white cat called Ace, um, who sadly disappeared after a few years. And my father actually never got over that either. Um, he, I mean, he was absolutely crushed, as we all were, but. Um, you know, my, my dad always sort of said it was almost like my mother dying again, and it was just a really sad time, you know, it just shows the bond that we have with, with animals. animals. Yes, <laughs> and your cat just wandered off one day, and that's what happened? He was friendly. I mean, he used to meet us after school. He'd come to the end of the road, and he'd oh. walk back with my sister at night at school, and everybody loved him. Everybody, he had a little barrel with his name, with our name inside, oh. Robinson. Oh. Everyone thought that the cat's name was Robinson, so oh. they all called him. <laughs> oh, that's adorable. And I think that's what made him so easy to steal. We were told afterwards that it was undoubtedly vivisectionists that had stolen him. And if we put an advert up, mm. I remember clear as day, if we put an ad in the papers for £50, we might get him back because that was double the price of what they got for vivisection cats in those days. Oh, my but God. We're back. So, I know, very sad. That yeah. is sad, unfortunately. And... So I guess you, you had always this love in, for animals uh, growing up and uh, did you always aspire to have a career with, uh, in animal welfare? Or? Always, always, but my dad had a different thought. <laughs> oh yes, what did your dad want you to do? Yeah, he wanted me to be a secretary. Oh. So, <laughs> Animal welfare or secretary? <laughs> I mean, he was he was very responsible. He wanted he said everything at that time, which it did, survives on paper. So as long as you had a good secretarial career, you'd never be out of a job. And he was quite right, bless him. So he made my sister and I go to you know secretarial school and and college. And you know, to this day, in fact, my shorthand and typing skills have become eminent. <laughs> totally. So I love him for that. But 
I, you know, and then I flunked physics and chemistry at school. So I knew I was going to never be a vet. I knew that. <laughs> so I, by my time, I went to, I worked for a vet when I was about 16 after school for a couple of years. I loved that. I really adored it as a volunteer. Um, I worked in a cattery in school holidays. So I cleaned out cat poo for weeks and weeks and weeks <laughs> at a cattery. And, um, you know, I, I just did anything I could to be around animals. And then when I moved to Hong Kong, exactly the same thing. I, I began to work for a vet, you know, and, and just thoroughly loved it, you know, before I then went into full-time employment. Well, that, speaking of which, uh, the move back in 1995 is when you first moved to Hong Kong. And I believe you were working as a consultant for the International Fund of Animal Welfare. Is that correct? Yeah, I moved in 1985 to Hong Kong and with my then husband, who was an airline pilot. And I, I was walking along uh, along the beach and I saw someone in the distance walking with a cat. And I thought, that's, a, that's an interesting one. So I went over to say hello and it turned out that he was the Asia representative for the International Fund for Animal Welfare. So I'd always supported them in the UK and I just said to him, wow, if ever you need a, you know, an assistant, a volunteer, any person, and he did. And so I started working for him part time for a couple of years. And then when he and his wife Alex left Hong Kong, um, I took over his job. And that's, that's as they say, is, no you know, I, worked for, I worked for I4 and really had a great, wonderful time. Yeah. And what kind of work were they doing? Uh, they were principally located in uh, China. They were doing, um, well, I guess, animal welfare work. Well, they're, they're based in Boston, Massachusetts. That's the head office for I4. So it's a very big organization. Okay. And it's their, you know, Asia representative. So I was doing a lot of undercover work at the live animal markets of mm. South Korea, China, the Philippines. Um, Taiwan, etc. I was, you know, investigating dog and cat slaughter. I was investigating the use of wild species in the traditional medicine industry. So I was doing, you know, quite a quite a lot of that time. And and I, I, you know, when I think back, the stuff that I saw, you know, and I guess still do to this day in Asia, you know, it's um, it's quite. Uh, it, it, I mean, it's. I, I don't even, you can't describe it. You really can't describe it unless you've seen these places. It must and be overwhelming. It must be sight, overwhelming. Yeah. Absolutely. The sights the sound, the smell of these places is life changing. Absolutely life changing. Yeah. And it, that kind of set you on your path to creating Animal Asia, I believe. Um, where you started it from your home in 1998. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit how, what led you to create Animal Asia? What was the purpose of creating Animals Asia? Uh, it was very clear. I'd, I'd actually had a, a moment on a bare bile farm in 1993 when I went to do an investigation in one of these places in China. And a journalist friend of mine had just come back from one and said, you, you need to go and see this place. So I did, I grabbed a couple of my friends, We you know, run over to the border across into southern China and we joined a tour group of Japanese and Taiwanese tourists and walked onto this bear bile farm. You weren't allowed to see the bears being extracted for bile or in the cages. No. You, you were just taken to a shop to buy bear bile and you were taken to see the breeding bears that were kept in pits. Um, mm -hmm. Somewhat more healthy than the other, the, the bile extraction bears. But because my friend had just been, he, he, you know, he told me where the, the basement was. We went down the steps and I just came across my own living hell in this place. Um, and as I was walking around this room, I backed too closely, obviously, into one of the cages. I felt something touch my shoulder. I knew I'd got too close to a cage and jumped back in shock. And instead of, you know, being hurt by a bear, there was just this female moon bear with her paw stretched through the bars of the cage. Oh my God. And I I did something that I'd say to everybody today was the most stupid thing I've ever done in my life, but I didn't know anything about Asiatic black bears. I knew nothing about bear farming. And she just seemed so gentle and so curious by my presence that it seemed the most natural thing to do to take her paw. And instead of hurting me, she just squeezed my fingers. And you know, we would never, never, never do anything like this. We've no. rescued over 600 bears. You would never, even our friendliest bears, you'd never do it because they're curious, they're mischievous. They could potentially be very, very aggressive as of they are course. on the phone. But she didn't hurt me. She squeezed my fingers. And as I say, that, that one moment in time changed my whole life, my whole life. And I knew from that second, I wanted to do something that would end 
the plight of, of those bears in cages. And I, I knew I'd never see her again, and I never did. And I hope she's dead. I always say I hope she's dead because I can't bear the thought that one bear that changed everything about my life, that changed everything about bear bar farming, that, that changed the course of history in terms of ending bear bar farming today. I, you know, I can't bear that she's still suffering today. Oh, well, so that was a very defining moment. And so you decided at that, well, I mean, this was 1993. So you set your path to create Animals Asia. And I guess the number one goal uh, at the beginning was to end this bear bile uh, trade that happens quite rapidly in, Asia, in China. And you also mentioned Vietnam. Can I deduct that those are the two main countries that have bear bile uh, farms? Yeah, absolutely. Although, you know, there's uh, Cambodia that no longer has any. There's Myanmar that has maybe about 50. There's Laos that has about 150. And South Korea that has about 500 bears oh. on um, But, you know, these are all countries where the trajectory seems to be going down. Now, certainly in, in South Korea, it's illegal now to farm bears for their oh. bile. So sadly, there are loopholes that allow the farmers to keep the bears and slaughter them when they're 10 years old for their whole gallbladders. So there's, you know, still horrible stuff going on. But but certainly China and Vietnam are the two main countries okay. that allow this industry to develop. And uh, for viewers at home, and my, including myself, what is it? Uh, what is bear bile commonly used for? Okay, um, it's a really good question, Jade, uh, because I think. Contrary to what most people think, um, bear bile actually works. So it's in Chinese medicine, it's a cold medicine to treat heat-related illnesses like high fevers and high temperatures, red and sore eyes, anything that's inflamed, anything that involves okay. inflammation. Um, in Western medicine terms, this is the acid of bear bile, ursodeoxycholic acid or UDCA, has been known since about the 1950s to actually work and to um, help with chronic liver complaints, help with gallbladder issues, etc. In fact, in the West, they've been synthesizing this essential acid, um, UDCA, not from bears, but no. chem chemically. Yes, sizing. chemically, yes. For, for many, many decades now. So we can't disparage traditional Chinese medicine across the board. You know, we know things that like, you know, tiger penis, for example, and rhino horn. We know that, you know, there, there's no um, substantial evidence to show that those two products and, and many others indeed work. But bear bile, of course, we know it does work. So mm. we have to be sympathetic and sensitive, at least, yes. with traditional medicine practitioners. But also, by doing that, by being sensitive, you can then start to create a road into this discipline and start working with traditional medicine practitioners to the extent that they say, of course, we don't need bare bile. It can easily and cheaply be replaced by 54 different herbal alternatives and by synthetic bare bile too. So you don't need it. Those doctors themselves are saying that because you work holistically within the traditional medicine community. Well, so your background uh, and knowledge in uh, traditional Chinese medicine, which you do have, uh, must have been key in educating uh, locals that there are alternatives that are more, uh, that are as effective. Are they as effective as bare bile? And are certainly it's, uh, more ethical. <laughs> Well, we've got a, there's a fantastic doctor, professor in, here in Hong Kong, uh, Feng Yibin, who has done many, many studies on bear bile and has come out with the conclusion that the herb coptis is um, better than bear bile for treating oh. uh, cancer, cancer cells, liver, oh. liver cancer. Wow. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff that's, been, that's, that's out there now, you know, and it's, it's up to us, I think, just to, 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 you know, bring the traditional medicine community, you know, um, along on this journey. And as they say, you know, as one particular doctor in China says, you know, how can this degradation of bears, you know, in cages, how can this death and disease be, you know, within the principle of harmony with nature, you know? And, and that's, I think, the core principle when you've got an animal that is being so badly treated, is so sick, so suffering, dying in droves on these yes. bear bars. How can that be in line with harmony in nature and traditional medicine? That's a very good point. So how, uh, how did you go about disseminating this information? And um, you work with local doctors, I guess, local Chinese uh, traditional doctors. And did you have conferences? I mean, how do you go about trying to uh, dissuade people from using bare bile? 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, we have in the past had a great many conferences and obviously worked very closely with the associations, associations themselves, not just in China and Vietnam, but across the world. For example, in, in the USA, there's a fantastic, you know, association of traditional um, medicine uh, headed up by the chairman, Li Xing Huang, who is amazing, you know, and she will often go to conferences and talk about the use of animals and how they can be replaced in traditional medicine. Oh, wow. um, it, in Vietnam, there's an association of 60,000 members that we've been working with now for many, many years. And they've agreed that by the end of this year, the last remaining 5% of their doctors who prescribe their bile will no longer do that. So that's 60,000 members done. With, that is with, with, huge. That is a huge victory. Well, congratulations. I mean, you've been working on this for so many years. And I guess I, it was a slow progress, I'm, I'm assuming, in 1998 to now, today. Um, so, can you speak about, uh, like, uh, you also created two um, bear sanctuaries, uh, one in yeah. Chengdu, China, and one in Tam Dao, Vietnam. Uh, so, can you talk about, like, how you went about uh, creating uh, this uh, change in China? On Yeah, I mean, things don't happen overnight in China or Vietnam, <laughs> we know. You know, they just don't. And you have to, patience is not my middle name, but certainly... <laughs> By, to by exercise patience, patience yes. <laughs> right. It is a um, virtue. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, honestly, Jade, I've been blessed to have the most phenomenal team. You know, the whole Animals Asia team. I, sh I just want to pay credence, if I forget later in the interview, to, to you know, to everybody here in this organization. They, they you know, we, we, are, we call ourselves a family, and indeed we are, you know, and especially at times like this with the coronavirus obviously hitting everybody. Exactly. Times when you, you need the presence of your family, and, and everybody is stepping up through the most hideous times. But, you know, in, in China, you know, we, we still have the same China director that is one of our founding members, Boris, um, in 1998. And in Vietnam, we have an amazing guy called uh, Tuan. Uh, Bendixson, who has been heading up the Vietnam campaign there as well. And, you know, these are people that have really seriously dedicated everything that they have had to these campaigns. So I think that is why we've got the sanctuaries that we have. We've grown organically, you know, in both in both countries. You know, immediately we started Animals Asia, we realized that we needed a vet, we needed an accountant, and we needed a lawyer. So I got all that because I needed people to be able to support speak from professionalism um, and I think that's that's done us really well throughout these years um, so the sanctuaries you know we knew nothing about bears we really didn't you know and so we just brought in the appropriate people to sort of teach us about the surgeries about the anesthetics we work very closely with the governments in both countries we've been working with the global federation of animal sanctuaries and now to the, de to the time where we've got the we've got the um, uh, a Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries Award um, for Best Sanctuary in, in both China and Vietnam. So we're really proud to have, have grown, as I say, properly throughout these years to the professionalism that we see today on bear management and bear care. There's been a long, long journey, I can't tell you. And, you know, financially and, and in terms of resources, it's been tough. It's been really tough. Absolutely. Um, but, but I'm still here. You have to see it through and, and uh, your commitment to uh, animals and certainly bears is, uh, is, is well needed. Uh, so is the bear bile trade still as um, strong as in China? Like, has it reduced? Like, have you seen a, a reduction in the use of bear bile? Or? Well, we, you know, China is still legal. Sadly. So, you know, while we're seeing, I mean, anyone that comes to the sanctuary, I can absolutely promise you that every single person that visits the sanctuary, there is no one that says, oh, bear bar farming should continue. You know, they see the befores and after, you know, our, our bears, oh my God, the, the, the pathology of these animals has been horrendous. We call them our broken bears when we receive them, you know, physically and psychologically, yes. they are done, absolutely yes. done. And, and when they die, they will die as a consequence of the bear farming industry. There is no doubt about that at all. But we have terrific vet staff, you know, that we can keep keep these animals happy and healthy until the time that we obviously realize that their, their days their days are, have ended, you know. Um, and I think that's what's really appealing to the communities in both China and Vietnam, when they just see happy, healthy bears bouncing out of their, you know, dens in the morning to into the enclosures and, exactly. and living 
the most amazing life, you know. So we've still got a lot of work to do in China. There are still many thousands of bears there that are kept legally on these bear farms. But again, we know that, you know, there are certain inconsistencies and problems within the industry as well. And I think now with the coronavirus and with people's obvious distaste even more now of consuming the products of wild animals we're going to see great change and indeed we are seeing great change already in china yes. so in sorry i was saying vietnam of course it's done it's ended we have the agreement with the vietnam oh government oh my god that is phenomenal that i mean i hope we'll be toasting <laughs> to that victory you say at the end of 2020 it will no longer be uh, prescribed no, in vietnam is Chinese, the, sorry, the traditional medicine will no longer be prescribed that contains bear bile. By the year 2022, bear bile farming will, will be over. We've signed an MOU with the government of Vietnam to do. <laughs> well, okay, well, that's one down, another one to go. <laughs> but um, that's fantastic. And so I, I think you, you said that you have a team of uh, vets uh, that actually analyze the debilitating effects on the bears, you know, that have been where the bile has been extracted for many years. What are those effects? Can you speak about those uh, on the bears? Like, okay. I where do you start? Okay, so they're kept in tiny wire cages, um, generally so small that they can hardly move. Uh, in Vietnam, the cages are slightly bigger, but still no environment, obviously, for a wild species. So, you know, their psychological health is, is severely, severely damaged um, and traumatized. Um, and we, we, you know, we often say that the bears are cage crazy. So they have, you know, um, scars on their faces and wounds where they bang their heads against the bars of the cage. They will often chew down onto the bars as well and break their teeth, um, uh, you know, just because of, of frustration stress and misery and the, and the pain that they're experiencing. Yes. A lot in like fur farms, I mean animals that are kept in fur farms, that's the same thing, they start uh, by uh, eating at each other because they, they go crazy, stir crazy. Uh, an animal like that should not be kept in a cage, right? So. Analogy, Jade. It really, they, they will self-mutilate on these farms as well as you say, exactly the same way they do on fur farms. Yeah. Uh, Many of them have their teeth cut back to gum level. They will have their paw tips cut away to stop their claws from growing. Um, they will, you know, the methods of bile extraction are so crude, unbelievable, because you have to get into the bear's abdomen to get through to the gallbladder to take out the bile, of course, that's then used in the medicines. So, you know, that form of surgical mutation and degradation is also extremely damaging to the bears bodies and causes ripple effects as well you not just you don't just have problems with the gallbladders that are inflamed and thickened and, and having contaminants inside um, but you also have problems with things like the liver where you know a, a huge majority of our bears will get liver cancer as a result of that exactly. liver that's what I was thinking it's it, physiologically it has a, a massive impact on these bears and most of the bears on your sanctuary I'm assuming their longevity is very shortened by this uh, abuse yeah. It can be, but you know, you know, we have, so we remove very often the gallbladders so that that quality of life improves. We have a lot of them on heart medications because they have dilated aortas they, as a result of the stress, you know, they, many of them have their eyes removed because they've got terrible eye damage or eye pathology because again of their treatment on the bare bile farms. Um, but you can, you can sort of postpone all of this again by keeping them on medication, ensuring that their nutrition is at a really high level, ensuring that their you know, psychology is at a, a fantastically heightened yes. um, level. They're playing out there with their friends as well. So for bears that aren't normally social, Wild, we find very often, you know, at our sanctuaries, they do form lifelong friends wow. with, with their other and that's that's so good for a bear yes. not not physically to be playing with each other but psychologically it's good for their heads as well you know to be out there every day as well and that's the nicest thing is just to see everything change when they come in they're just lashing out they're aggressive they don't see the difference between us and bear bar farmers they just no. see us as people that's going to hurt them and then over the next few days weeks months you see their whole characters change and blossom and emerge as individuals like you and i are individuals it's the most amazing thing it is amazing and on that note i can speak about that because i've volunteered for hsi and uh, the dogs that they rescued on uh, korean dog meat farms 
when they bring them to the shelter here in Montreal, Canada, we have a, an emergency shelter. You can see the tr the dogs transform. I mean, the day one, they're still like extremely traumatized. They're still very scared. They're afraid of touch. And then by the end of it, you know, like I would say within a month, you see progress. At the end of two months, it's like the, the dog is no longer the same. You know, it's becoming uh, social and it acclimates and it, it learns to trust again. And it's a beautiful thing to witness, you know, so. I'm so glad you do that. You, oh. I always describe it as the light coming on into their eyes. You um, see the light, don't you see? Suddenly everything changes oh, and you go, yes. wow. There's hope. <laughs> There's always hope. So that's wonderful. Yeah. And I wanted to now uh, touch upon all these programs that Animals Asia has instilled in China and Vietnam, or maybe this is more China. Uh, so namely, uh, Animal Asia works on many facets in helping dogs and cats in Asia with programs such as Dr. Dog, Professor Paws, and of course, Trap, Neuter, and Return uh, programs. So if we talk about Dr. Dog, uh, this was a program that was started back in 1991, before you ever started Animals Asia. And it was the actual first animal therapy program in all of Asia. That is amazing. <laughs> You're the oh, one who well. started this. Um, so yeah. Everything has a beginning, and, and the beginning there, I freely admit it, I stole the idea from the UK. I was reading a pamphlet about pets as therapy, pet dogs, Yes. And, and I had my old golden retriever next to me, Max, and I just went, oh my gosh, Max, you can do this. This is animal therapy. You go into hospitals and you make people feel <laughs> I, I feel how much better. My dog makes me feel, you know, yes. so I feel got to work in Hong Kong and I began phoning around and I couldn't believe the response first of all it was terrible you know nurses were saying you're not seriously suggesting you're going to bring oh. a dirty unhygienic dog into a hospital right. environment and I said yes I am but they're not dirty and unhygienic because they're vaccinated and because they're well cared for and da, da, da. you know and she and then I finally got through to one matron of a children's hospital uh, matron Al, she was just lovely and she just said to me okay Jill I've heard of animal therapy you had one hour in the garden with one dog oh my god and, and that, that, you made the it. most of that hour <laughs> they bought paraplegic children they wheeled them out both in wheelchairs and in their beds it was just the most touching thing and there was one moment that Max went up to a boy that was lying on his bed, flat in his bed, uh, numb from the waist down, paralyzed from the waist down, and Max rose up, put his huge golden paws on this boy's bed, and the boy just reached out and spoke Max, and the kid's face just lit up like a Christmas tree, and and that was it. That was the the, the I, we bought the South China Morning Post. They were make you know taking photos, and the next, next day that stopped started a landslide of people wanting to volunteer their dogs and hospitals wanting the wanting the program wow. and that's how it started it and it started in, in hong kong obviously where you were living uh but at one point did it, it made its way in mainland china i believe well a few years later you know i mean even in hong kong you know it, it, it it's strange because there was still a lot of sort of caution around this you know so right. we had to get little staff on board you know and then once we started doing that then we had this sort of academic review if you like that we could take to China because China very often relies on paper on academia yes prove you know sort of testimonials to uh, mainland China that dr. dog mm -hmm. and animal therapy really really works it lowers blood pressure and cholesterol levels it does all the it things we know that's right exactly so you know suddenly now this was starting in China and we had Chinese doctors on board, which was phenomenal, you know, and now, oh, wow. yeah, we're, we're, seeing it, we're seeing it everywhere, everywhere across the country. It's just lovely, lovely to see it. It still goes on to this day. It's, uh, yeah. it, it, now it's wi much more widely accepted and people see the benefits and the change, so that's wonderful. Um, also, there's Professor Paws, and um, Professor Paws is an innovative program that sees registered therapy dogs visit local schools in Hong Kong and China to teach children to overcome their fears of dogs, learn safety around dogs, responsible pet care, and compassion for all animals. So, Professor Paws, when did that program start? What year? Gosh, that. That was 2004, I believe, and that was begun by our 
now she's our vice chairman of the board, Annalise. I knew Annalise when she was six. Her mother was my vet. <laughs> so it's a small world how these things these things come around, you oh, know. But and Annalise started this because she wanted it as an extension of Dr. Dog, you know, to show um, school children not to be afraid of dogs in society. You know, we live in a, in a region where, you know, rabies, it's the second highest incidence of rabies in the world is in China, you know. So yes. here in Hong Kong, while we haven't got rabies in Hong Kong, there's still very, very big caution, you know, surrounding dogs. Okay. So people have to be very, very careful. Um, and, and so we want Thing to cross that barrier, you know, and we thought, wow, children in schools, and we knew that, you know, in other countries, that children with reading disabilities are far less embarrassed to read to a dog than they are to a teacher. And um, absolutely true. So we began Professor Pause, and you know, for kids that wanted to enhance their English language learning, or even in China, their Chinese language learning. Um, and the reading material that they have is all about the world around them, the environment, how to approach dogs safely, how to recognize their body language, not to be frightened of dogs. So these kids become ambassadors. They go back to their parents. Mm. They say, you know, we've learned so much about dogs. We really shouldn't be frightened of them. We should be respectful. But we can also be super loving to them. And provided we treat them right, we vaccinate them properly, they can be loving family mm. members. And this sort of message then goes through society yes. you know it may be small jade and it is you know but but it's it's something that is is eventually permanent because it becomes in the minds of these kids and as they're growing up and their parents that dogs are not to be feared in society yes. that you know benefit from be, living harmoniously with them well i mean the younger generation is definitely our hope um especially for the dog cat me trade ending i mean we do believe that it will eventually end uh, and it's uh, with programs like this, you know, that will teach children that dogs are indeed man's best friend and they can be uh, incredible companions and there's nothing to fear. So, so that's wonderful. And, and do you approach schools or how does that work? How do you like... Uh, you know, either way, it works both okay. ways. And the other thing as well is that if we can't get to school, you know, you can't get to every school in China. So no. we have a fantastic um, little uh, video, CD, a DVD, that we now send across the country called Cat and Dog Welfare Around Us. And this is narrated by fantastic um, Asian celebrity Karen Mock. She's called the Madonna of Asia. Everybody oh my knows. God. What's her name? Karen Mock? M O K. Everybody knows Karen Mock. Oh, she, okay. she, wow. <laughs> Now um, I know and her. <laughs> and so she's just, in that video. Okay. You'll see it will be flooded by, by Karen Mock. She's massive, massive in Asia, especially yeah. China and Hong Kong. Everybody loves her. So she's narrating this DVD. We've known her for years. She's been our ambassador for years. She's wonderful. Um, so she's narrating this DVD. Um, and again, it, it, it not just talks about, you know, um, sort of be, being comfortable with dogs and becoming close with dogs it talks about how to manage your own dogs if you've got pets at home and um, okay. cats and dogs at home. um it's it also talks about be very very careful be protective of your dogs especially in china because we know that nearly 100 percent of dogs are stolen for the meat trade yeah. so again yeah. these 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 dvds contain very subtle messages about how to care for your dogs but how to protect them as well from the meat industry Oh as my well. God, that's wonderful. That's such a great idea because obviously it takes someone of influence that has influence in society and a local celebrity like a Karen Mock is certainly a great ambassador for this message. So that's wonderful. Um, I also wanted to talk about the trap and neuter return programs that you have. Uh, so you train around 100 animal welfare groups in China that rescue dogs and cats and undertake other welfare initiatives that directly help companion animals. Uh, so I've interviewed John Daly on the podcast for Soy Dog, and he explained the sheer size of the overpopulation of stray dogs and uh, cats in Thailand was a huge problem, and obviously one that would, would have fueled the dog cat me trade over there. Um, so uh, Soy Dog has done tremendous work uh, at reducing the uh, overpopulation. Is it safe to assume that China also has an overpopulation of strays? I imagine because apart from your programs, I mean, it's still on a small scale, I imagine, and all of China, there's a lot of uh, strays, I imagine. 
obviously, you know, these animals are used in the food industry in China. You you don't sort of see, a, you know, um, you know, groups of stray dogs as you do perhaps in Thailand. It's not okay. quite the same. But what you do see, especially in rural areas, is, you know, people have dogs to protect their homes. So they're sort of, you know, quite quite feral, but they're, they're still fed by the same, you know, by the, by the same people. Okay. So they keep home kind of safe. So, you know, this, this is obviously, a, you know, a, a big problem in terms of the fact that they're stolen. Mm -hmm. um, for the because people are still upset when they're, you know, how even though they haven't sort of got them maybe inside the house or sleeping on their beds, they're they've still, still upset, got yes. Exactly, they still their sort of family dog mm -hmm. as well. So, um, so the trap new to return program that we have actually doesn't involve dogs. It, it's it's cats. It's mostly um, cats, right? community cats across the country um, and we've been working with a very specific group in Beijing called Lucky Cat and now fanning this out helping I think about um, 80 local groups across the country um, you know in in track news of cat colonies um, which is a lovely lovely program again it's a well-rounded program where you often get elderly citizens that are involved in feeding these cat communities Once Desexed and returned, you see the community obviously gradually reducing over time, but you also see the community beginning to embrace these cats as well because no longer are they diseased because they're vaccinated, no longer are they calling out for mates and waking people up at night because That's they've right. been. So, you know, it's again, it's a lovely, holistic, well rounded program that benefits the community as well as the cats themselves. That's wonderful. So, uh, Vietnam is known to have a very uh, large thriving cat meat trade so i imagine is this tnr program available in vietnam as well or it there yet no we, we at the moment we're working on actually more dogs in vietnam now because it, like china there's a massive massive industry there yes. and illegal you too yes. so you know these dogs are trucked in from you know one end of the country to the other it, it's just hideous yes. so we what you know in there, Tuan and team are working with the Vietnam government now to, you know, put up border patrols to um, confiscate some, you know, the dogs from these trucks. We're trying to raise money now to to do a confiscation confiscation program. But until then, we're putting um, banner posters up all along what we call the hi the Highway One, okay. along from the country to show the truck drivers that they are on notice that if they're bringing dogs illegally, you know, through the country, yes. they are going to get but you know this is very early days it's not as mature a program as we've got in China um, but we are part of a, a what we call the Asian Canine Protection Alliance or ACPA um, which is trained for animals um, for paws and the Humane Society the Humane Society International as well so no. we're, we're part of a collaboration of groups that is addressing this sale and slaughter of dogs in Vietnam well, um, that that was something we touched upon also with uh, John uh, of Soya Dog because he says they've reduced, but they pretty much eradicated the dog uh, meat trade in Thailand, but there's still a uh, illegal transportation of dogs from Thailand to Vietnam and to Vietnam, and, and it is very, very cruel and vicious. So it's good to know that there are programs out there trying to raise awareness and reduce it. And also, uh, we're supposed to have the um, uh, Formula One uh, in April, I think, 22nd in Hanoi, Vietnam. And uh, there's a petition out there uh, that was started by Soya Dog we're hoping they would be able to make a statement to, you know, an international organization like Formula One to make a statement discouraging people from engaging in this trade. Uh, what do you think about that? Uh, I think it, whatever it means, you know, I don't think, I don't agree with um, boycotts, for example. I think boycotts very often sort of harm the innocent cities of the country that you're boycotting. But I do believe in sort of obviously making making very specific points about an industry, especially one like the dog meat industry that is absolutely run under e illegal conditions. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. particularly in China, I have to say as well, where again, nearly 100% of those dogs are stolen. They're stolen from people's family homes or they're taken again from the streets. Yes. Um, and this is not just a, a question of animal welfare. This is a question of social welfare as well. And, and, and protection of people as well. When the dogs are stolen, they're very often poisoned, yes. so that top meat is entering the, you know, entering exactly. the food 
um, when you know when they're stolen from the streets, they very often have disease like parvovirus, distemper, leptospirosis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that and potentially even rabies. So that toxic meat is also entering the food chain of China. So you know, again, our programs sort of try to talk more functionally, I would say, you know, about the industry as a whole, rather than how cruel it is, which of course everybody knows it's cruel, it's yeah. horrible, it's yeah. but we have to get that in fact it's it's all also implicating the lives and the health of the communities in China and Vietnam as well. Well, speaking of which, um, we have an opportunity here with the coronavirus uh, breakout, because now it's a full pandemic, it's uh, today, today, we are March 19th, uh, over uh, close to 220,000 people have been infected worldwide, almost 9,000 deaths worldwide. So I would think, and you know, you, I would love for your opinion to, uh, for you to give us your opinion. I think it's a time like never before to actually pressurize uh, China in particular to instill animal welfare laws, or at least discourage this kind of industry that gives way to these outbreaks because like you just described these dogs are not vaccinated they have diseases and then the population ingests these and uh, you know it's a, it's a room for pandemics to continue um, so I know we were all encouraged at the fact that China has instilled a wildlife ban we're hoping it's going to be enforced um, can you give us your opinion about this and what is Animal A Animals Asia doing at this point with the government officials to try to really move towards legislation at this point? Yeah. Of course, like every other place in China, we are, you know, quietly talking with the authorities now about these issues. And I think that China, you know, is behaving very responsibly now in closing these live animal markets as they have been doing, you know, and looking at all the species that are for sale. Um, and we can only encourage that, you know, and we're seeing obviously a reduction in numbers of cases now um, in the country and of course a reduction in the number of deaths as well. So, you know, I, I absolutely know for sure that China is, you know, the, from, from the top down, you know, is to, you know, the president has been talking about harmony with nature now for quite a few years and we've been quietly working in the background to encourage this as well in everything we do in our sanctuary um, in China you know, with the bears, etc. Um, but now it's time, as you say, to look at these, these wild animal markets as a whole in terms of the melting pot, you know, of, of, of animals that are, that are there, wild and domestic, obviously, um, and endangered in some cases as well. And, and I think China is looking very, very seriously at that. There are still things that we hope to encourage more. There are still animals that I think are being slated in traditional medicine that um, may sort of remain in the, in the, in the chain, as it were. Okay. Um, but again, you know, we know that there are, you know, very, very many big, big people in China that are talking very professionally and scientifically to the government there about the implications of keeping any animals now in, in the wild animal food chain. Are you able to name some of these uh, influential people or is it, <laughs> would well, it be I anyone I that we would know over here in the West? No, certainly some of the universities, some of the big universities, okay. some of so, so just just influential business people, you know, people that are clearly seeing their livelihoods affected as well now, you know, exactly. as a result. I think there's a, you know, a massive, massive think tank in China, you know, on this very subject and has been for many, many, many weeks now. So I think we're going to see great change in the country. I really do. I think this is, we cannot go back. We've done SARS. We're now doing coronavirus, you know, COVID-19. We cannot go back to those dark days ever, ever again. And I think that the, you know, the leadership is taking that very, very seriously now. So it well, may still take time. I'm not saying that it may still take time, but we are, you know, to work and help what, wherever we are needed. We have a fantastic vet team, of course. We have great veterinary discipline on site in terms of the bears. We know a lot about, you know, other issues in the country. So right. we're, we're on side to help wherever we can help and just support the authorities in China in this as we move forward. Absolutely. Um, the time is now, and I believe that when the, the sheer impact this has had on their economy is certainly a, a good reason to try to put an end to this. Um, so the wildlife markets that, that were originated, uh, where the COVID-19 originated from was Wuhan. 
um, it's they would sell wildlife but also dogs and cats so I guess our um, animal welfare groups over here were all hoping uh, that they would uh, include dogs and cats as well in that ban um, so and any thoughts on that yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, there's encouragement. And again, we have to remember there's over 200 local animal welfare groups in China now. 200. You know, when I began... Okay, <laughs> it's grown. One group in the 80s, and now there's over 200. Wow. These are passionate, intelligent, professional people heading up these groups, you know, and they, are, they have a voice, a very big voice in China. And also, they are working very collaboratively with their local provincial government officials as well. So what we've just seen in the last few weeks is that Shenzhen, for example, is now tabling the end of the dog meat trade, the dog and the cat meat trade yeah. in Shenzhen. <laughs> And this was one of the hot spots in China. You know, this was one of the, the, the focal areas. Oh, for was it? Okay, I thought it was the opposite. I thought they had a very a small uh, dog cat meat trade. Oh, no. This is Guangdong. This is, this, Guangdong is one of the hot spots of dog eating in China, uh -huh. in the south. Okay. A lot of horrible live animal markets, you know, originated. Um, and now it looks like the Shenzhen authorities are really lobbying hard to take dog and cat meat off the table now. Now, it's still going for public approval. So, you know, we, we're just keeping everything crossed that, you know, because again, Jay, we have to remember that this is again, it's also a very sensitive subject. You know, even people potentially sitting on the fence may say, you know, well, this is part of China's culture. You know, we've eaten dog and cat for a great many years. This is something that's our right to do. So we know that, for example, they criticize France for eating horse meat. You know, it, it's just... Yes. <laughs> We have different cultures. We have different sensibilities. But, <clears throat> um, but the fact is, the fact is that Shenzhen is starting this ball rolling, you know. And I and I I think that even just by talking like this, you are starting the debate in the whole of the country. And that's exactly the sort of thing that we want to see start happening, you know, be, with with the Chinese themselves. That's right. It's, exactly. It has to come from them. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. But now that we're t touched upon a subject that you're saying it's, it's been a long tradition of eating dogs and cats, like can you, um, as someone who has so much experience and knowledge in uh, this field, can you tell us a little bit more about the history of dog eating in China, and as far as you know? Well, you know, it, it seems to have sort of gone up and down throughout the dynasties, you know, in the country. So, and in fact, I think a lot of your listeners will be surprised to know that, um, you know, during the, the Tang dynasty and the Qing dynasty, there was great benevolence towards animals. You know, the emperors there were yes, talking. Yes. That, I read up you know, on that. <laughs> right. They right. love okay. dogs. Yes, absolutely. Right. And they revere them. They actually more than that. They revere them, you know, and, yes. and they... Want, they didn't want animals slaughtered for a third of 365 days a year, um, or they didn't want pregnant animals slaughtered, or they didn't want baby animals slaughtered. Yeah. Um, there, were, there were a lot of different, um, you know, it, things put in place to show that benevolence towards that. There are a lot of, um, you know, authorities in China um, on the subject, you know, a lot of professors that will talk about China's benevolence. So they, yes. it's a very subject I think you know to be honest with you I think you know after the the awful period of the 60s and the 70s and the great leap forward the cultural revolution and things as well um, you know people were then looking on dogs very differently a sort of bourgeois you know it was it why should we care about companion animals when so many millions of people are starving you know and yes. I think that's a big shift that, in China that was a shift yes very um, sadly Yes, yeah. I, I spoke to Dr. Peter J. Lee, and he mentioned something like that. There was like famine, and you know, so obviously, uh, if you have people starving to death, you're not going to encourage people to have a dog as a companion animal. So, of course, very we saw them killed and eaten as well, you know, by their families. So it was a horrible time, obviously, as we know in China. But, you know, today things are changing. Today things are changing massively. I can't tell you. You know, I, again, I've been there since the 80s. And now, 30-something yes. years You've later. You've seen it before it's your eyes, yes. It's, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't waste your time and your listeners' time, Jade, and I wouldn't be wasting my time, you know, if I didn't see this tangible tr change in the country. Of it's course. fantastic. And, again... 
the local groups are driving it and we need to be working behind those local groups to drive them you know that's our that's the biggest approach by animals asia is to really support local groups as much as we can in all of their disciplines whether they're rescuing animals whether they're lobbying for animal protection you know whether they're upgrading their um, facilities if they've rescued the animals in the first place right. you know to help them with more education um, leaflets and banners and materials all that sort of thing work with the local groups just do that exactly and as, now that there's like 200 local groups of activist groups um, can you mention some of them can you talk about some of the the bigger ones uh, that we should be supporting and, and, and encouraging <laughs> Is that you know uh, they do different things. A lot of them do. So I think it would be unfair of me to to oh, you know no, highlight. Oh no, single out a, a particular you know, group. Yes, you're right. Well, <laughs> what we do is we have conferences um, every year for these groups. So every every. Every year we have conferences for groups and government officials to get together and then every alternate year we have conferences for just these animal welfare groups. So we get the leaderships of these groups come along where we talk about the problems, the solutions, etc. So I think if I mentioned one I would get completely trampled uh, no, on. You're absolutely right. I, <laughs> bad of me to ask. Um, I just... Okay. I, but but they are all, they're just brilliant and I think people just go online, do your homework, go and see yes. what, you know, just go look, you'll see the groups in China, they'll pop up and, you know, and, it, it's... And if all else fails, encourage Animals Asia because they support them and you fund a lot of their work and their, their campaigns and, and so on. Um, lastly, I know we're pressed for time, but I did want to cover, uh, you did a massive investigation in the dog meat trade. Uh, back in June of 2015, you published a report, a full-length report, uh, following a four-year undercover investigation. And uh, your investigation covered 15 cities and eight provinces in the northeast, southern, and central China where dog eating is most prevalent. Um, so I read some of that report, which was very difficult, I must say, because it's, it's very emotionally um, uh, difficult to read that. Um, but I came up with some of the summary points. And uh, your report does uncover the fact that China, as opposed to South Korea, does not have a large uh, scale breeding facility and not even small scale breeding facilities. Uh, the majority of the d victims of the dog meat trade are really stolen pets, like you described before, and strays. So that is what is fueling the dog meat trade in China. Um, also, you uncover that the slaughtering process is very cruel with the uh, dogs being beaten, boiled and skinned alive in front of each other. Uh, that was seen at all locations. Uh, there's also a huge lack of sanitary and hygienic protocol that gives way to much health concerns. COVID-19. Um, and then there's all the illegal aspect at all levels of the supply chain from having no transportation permits to no certificates of origin to no vaccination certificates, etc. Also, the typical profile, you do profile the typical dog, cat, meat consumer. And I think the average age is older. I think it's like mostly men. I think men more than women. Uh, 40s, 50s, uh, and so on. Um, the income level, I'm not sure. Would, would, is it more common and, and high in net worth? Maybe I'll let you speak about the profile, the typical profile. <laughs> Oh, I think you meant the income level of those people benefiting from the industry and, and, and you know I do want to address that as well because it's just a complete unknown because it is working under such illegal practices as well you know so so one never knows what you know what the whole um, trade is worth if you like but yeah. it's obviously yeah. it's obviously worth a great deal to people that can just steal these dogs for free yeah you know, the so cost is nothing <laughs> dog farms that's exactly why there's no dog farms yeah. you know when I first China in the 80s, you know, there were some dog farms, but now there's absolutely nothing of any big level at all, you know, and the, and because they have to vaccinate, they have to stop the spread of disease, they have to feed the dogs, they have to have personnel to feed the dogs, you yeah. know, all this costs money, and it's so much cheaper, in fact, free, of just course. to do treats, of course. And, so, yeah. And, and as I discussed with uh, Dr. Lee, he said that you can actually, I mean, of course, there's no animal protection laws in China at this point, at this stage. Uh, there's no animal welfare, of course, 
but he said you can use existing laws to discourage and so that's what a lot of people have been doing if you don't have the permits you cannot yes. take the dogs you cannot transport them across borders um and so all these things are in place uh, to try to discourage um people from that, engaging but you can also use volunteers you can also as we're doing people across the country who know the the rule of law as well who know that the licenses and permits that are required and they will go into the restaurants and they will demand to see those permits and the licenses. And when they can't produce them, they will then go to the local authorities and mm. the authorities will act. And I think, again, this will be quite a surprise to your listeners that over this over these last couple of years, um, the volunteers across the country and indeed our investigations have seen about 350 restaurants now either being closed down or told to stop selling the dog meat. Mm -hmm. um, you know, or, or, you know, it forced to come into line as well. So, you know, there are things that people can and are willing to do. And as I say, if you're using the local groups properly, they are very passionate and willing because then it helps them because it stops them having to take in all these confiscated dogs from the trucks, right. you know, when, when they're finding them, you know, against the law. So, you know, again, this is a very holistic program that involves everybody, not just the government, but local volunteers um, and people that can help. And uh, so your your investigation um, it led to this report. I'm, I'm assuming you've presented this report towards legislative proposals with the government. Um. I have to be quite careful, you know, because as I say to the general public, there is a, a massive amount of public that wants dog eating to end, and obviously a lot of dog loving public, cat loving public that have yeah. their own dogs now as well um, but there are also people as I said before that sitting on the fence that you know say this is our culture and if you go too far on public lobbying you bring those people now to saying who are you to say right. you know that this should end so again it's very important for people within China to be raising that debate together yes. and to be sort of tipping that balance and I think again as you have said you know with the coronavirus with the fact that we've got to doc Dr. Dog and Professor Paws going to hospitals and schools and disabled centers and sort of really upskilling or, or you know upgrading people's compassion if you like towards companion animals um, then we're seeing a shift in in terms of you know how people are looking at, at dogs and cats in the community as well and you're seeing increasingly a greater respect and a, and a greater um, attention towards this issue supporting the fact that dogs are our friends and cats and not food Yes, well, um, I guess we're about out of time, uh, but I did um, want to just ask you one uh, final question. Obviously, you've been dedicating 35 years of your life so far to this uh, cause of animal welfare in Asia. And I'm assuming at this point you would say, are you hopeful to see the end of this uh, dog cat meat trade in China? Absolutely, absolutely. Again, as I said before, I wouldn't be wasting your or my time exactly. on this. Sure of this, but we are seeing a massive, massive shift now. And again, with you know, with all the elements coming together, it seems like it it may even happen sooner rather than later. So you know, we we, we will still continue with the programs that we do. And Jade, I want to thank you for having me on the show. You know, just to to get this message to all and sundry that the fact that we do need the help, desperately need the help, and especially now in the coronavirus, we're probably not the only who are suffering, but but we are suffering financially now. So, you know, I want to appeal to, to your supporters yes. to join us, help us and come on board. Um, and thank obviously the team of Animals Asia who I, I just so blessed to have an amazing family like this. They are incredible. And how, how many uh, uh, team members do you have? It's a, it's a big group, right? Well, and again, I, you know, I can't believe it started out in my, my room in my house all those years ago and now we've got about 300 staff. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, envisage in a million years but you know they're, they're brilliant and you know they're working on all three components of, of our pro different program areas you know captive animal welfare cat and dog welfare and of course bear farming as well and um, and of course our amazing office staff our country offices you know I, I mean education everything it's 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 like a, a machine that I never thought I would see and it's like no. wow it's a, it's a dream come true <laughs> in many ways. So, yes, I do encourage all our viewers uh, to go at home and, and look up uh, Animals Asia website. There's a lot of information there. And yes, the time is now. We can move towards change and uh, you deserve our support. 
and uh, all these local activist groups deserve our support. So um, I encourage everyone at home to read up on it and to take action and, um, you know, stop uh, just signing petitions left and right. There's more concrete uh, actions that we can take that will have a lasting change. So I thank you, uh, Jill Robinson. You've been amazing. I'm so grateful for your time and you've been very generous with us and uh, we'll continue the conversation. Dave, thank you so much. Good pleasure, absolute pleasure. Thank All you. All right, thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.